Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today I'm going to provide a detailed building guide for Grand Cathay Factions in Total War Warhammer 3, with a particular focus on the native Grand Cathay territories presented at the launch of the game. Now as of the making of this guide, the game is on patch 1.3.1, .1, which predates the Immortal Empire's release, where Grand Cathay will expand from the current 8 provinces plus 3 gates to 16 provinces plus 3 gates and that will most likely bring more faction unique landmark buildings, bring potential changes to faction capital, where currently Weijing is a 8 settlement capital and it might become a 10 building capital, like most faction capitals. And we'll also see a 1 settlement magical forest province added inside Grand Cathay to function as a wood elf portal in Immortal Empires. But the core concept of this guide will remain true, and hopefully it can help you in your future Grand Cathay campaigns. So starting with the Imperial Road province here, we will first provide an overview of all of Grand Cathay's buildings as we move on in this guide. So the first thing we have to worry about in your early game is growth and income. So we have to come to the infrastructure tab, and the first four buildings here will deal with growth and income. Now these come in mutually exclusive pairs, as in we have two civic building, that is young and in, as well as two industry buildings, that is young and in, and this has a lot to do with our harmony mechanic. Now we do have a separate harmony guide that goes in much more detail, and I'll put a link on the top right in case you missed it on the channel, uh, but for those who understand how harmony works, we'll continue from here. So, in the early game, you can think of these as pairs, combos. You could go with the young civic building and then go with the in industry building because ultimately the goal is to keep your faction in harmony. So you want to cancel out your in yang values everywhere you go, whether it's technologies, whether it's with characters or with buildings in this case. So ideally, you have a harmony neutral situation in every single settlement. So looking at these pairs, the young variant of the civic building provides growth and construction cost discount, while the inversion provides income from buildings and the same amount of growth. So one is designed for the early game when you're building up, and one is designed for the late game once you have the entire province completed. Likewise, for the industry buildings, the young building is purely base income going from 50 all the way to 300. Meanwhile, the inn building has slightly more base income at the earlier tier, plus an income bonus multiplier for trade. But then at the later tier, once it goes to tier 3, it produces less income, but obviously still keeping the income multiplier from trade. So likewise, the inn building here is the early game building, as it has more base income early on and the same amount at tier 2 while having a trade bonus but at the final tier it starts falling short and in the late game when you run out of trade partners due to confederation of other grand cafe factions or conquest with other foreign allies you will have very few trades and the bonus from trade will mean a lot less and base income will mean a lot more so you can view these four buildings as two separate combos. You have the young civic plus the in industry in the early game. And once you have completed your settlement, you should convert them to the other combo. And it's quite easy to convert as you can just switch them for a very minor cost and a few turns depending on what level they are at. So for example, the final tier is going to cost you 900 plus 3 turns, and you can, uh, these are 2 turns with 600 costs, and these are like 1 turn with 300 costs. Uh, you obviously would want to wait till your settlement's complete to take full advantage of your construction cost bonus, and then swap them at the same time. So in 3 turns time, you're not getting hit with this 2 point of harmony disbalance uh, that will happen from this swap. Uh, if you swap both, obviously it will cancel each other out. And that's kind of the goal of how you want to build your settlements. In your minor settlements especially, these should be your first two buildings. The purpose of this is should they get raided in the future, their third building 
will likely get destroyed, or perhaps they raided and looted and your settlement level goes down by one, you will not lose any of your harmony buildings and thus not incur an imbalance from getting attacked. And that is quite key. So going beyond infrastructure buildings, we can talk about what we want to build next. Usually for myself, I tend to focus on income and I ignore defense buildings because my logic with most Total War game is that defense buildings is a cost for you that is taken away from potentially building up armies that are more active on the field. And while they do provide additional garrison, as you can see, there are an Inyang variant that's mutually exclusive as well for defense of Grand Cathay buildings. We have five extra units for tier one, six for tier two, and I think ultimately you get eight. Uh, the base garrison goes up with level, of course, uh, but the key in many of these attacks when you are caught off guard, when enemy forces are attacking one of your settlements that is unprotected, is that the enemy army size is usually either too weak to kill your garrison with the help of towers and walls, or they're way too strong, as then you're getting a full stack and they have many single entity, they have many uh, heroes, and their lords too strong for you to defend because normally your garrison's led by uh, one simple hero character and no lord. And that's not going to be helped by adding, you know, five more infantry peasant units, uh, you know, three jade warriors. They're not going to change the tide. There's a very small group of Goldilocks enemy sizes where your basic garrison has no chance, but adding five units will give you a chance of victory. Usually the case is either your garrison was good enough to defend anyways, or you are going to be doomed regardless whether you have a defense building or not. So instead of going for a defense building for this small chance, this Goldilocks slice of perfect enemy size that can come harass you, I tend to opt for any sort of resource building for more income right away. Or in the case of Weijing, there's a lot of landmark buildings. These are special location unique and faction unique buildings that should be considered uh, right away. They are usually quite powerful. For example, the Paradise Garden here gives faction wide growth and a big local income multiplier. And then other ones focus attend, uh, more on military. Uh, and over here you have another faction wide control bonus, faction wide lord recruitment bonus, faction wide income bonus, diplomatic relations with all other Cathay factions as well. These are all quite powerful and should be considered whenever they become available once you have the corresponding settlement level completed. Now, for the minor settlements, they are pretty simple to deal with. If you have resources, that should be your final building and you should go for it right away. If they don't have any resources, you can convert them either to a simple military outpost where you pick up something like the Jade Barrack, which maxes out at the third tier to provide additional local recruitment or once you get enough land and you can have 10 copies of the jade barrack you can lower their global uh, recruitment turn requirement by one turn which is quite useful as well defensive buildings i would ignore the ones that add garrison and put one sky lantern lookout the protection building in one of your minor settlements as it is only available at tier 3, doesn't upgrade, so kind of waste a space in your main settlement, which could build other things. Uh, so in this case, you always want to find a protection building slot in one of your minor counties. We have two resources on two of our settlements, therefore it fits perfectly here in the city of Shugengan. And that's going to be it for our minor settlements. If, let's say, you have multiple minor settlements that you know, have open slots because there's no resource, you already put the protection building in, you already put the Jade Barrack in. You could put a second Jade Barrack, but it would have no extra local bonus. It would just help you reach your 10 Jade Barracks for the global recruitment purpose. Or I like to go for a Sky Port. Uh, this provides additional local recruitment capacity and also adds an uh, Alchemist, which can be quite useful. Because if you look at the alchemist skill tree, as we come out to the map, we have one sitting right here. Alchemist of the 
Alchemist skill tree has a skill called Boost Income. Now this has been nerfed in a few patches since launch, and at most it can provide 6% additional income, which is not a lot uh, for their upkeep, depending on how many armies you have, which changes the supply limit. But in the early game, when you don't have that many armies, uh, and their supply line is not sky high, as in my case, they can be quite good in terms of being net positive income in your most lucrative province, which is going to be the Imperial Road. It's going to be the best income province for Grand Cathay factions in the entire map due to the fact that it has a ton of base income, including uh, the gold mine that it has as a resource, which provides 600 income rather than the 150 for all other resource buildings for Grand Cathay. And in addition for boost income, if you ever have the chance in the early game to farm for ancillary items, there is an ancillary item that is called the tax collector that will add 10% to your local income, which is actually quite big. And we have a few of them here to showcase, mainly to showcase how to farm them. And it's T. I have way too many items. They're here somewhere. There they are. All right, so they provide 10% income from local region for all buildings. Very useful, especially in high base income uh, commanderies or provinces in this case, too much three kingdoms. And we have 6% from their skill tree. So combine those, you're definitely gonna be net income positive. And the key here is you must win a battle while having negative income. Now this doesn't sound like a great situation, but you can artificially create this at certain moments to try to farm a bunch of these in burst. For example, we know the supply line mechanic will increase our upkeep by 4% for each army on legendary difficulty. And what you can do is have a couple of spare lords in your recruitment pool who you already recruited. So they basically go down on these cycles of five turns or four turn cooldown, depending on what skills you have on them uh, before they can be redeployed again. And before certain battles, if you have numerous battles, for example, three Corgan Warband have spawned to the north after clearing them out, um, you can summon your uh, four, five, you know, maybe even three, depending on how many you need, right, how close you are to negative, your lords out onto the field and turn up your supply line upkeep of your other armies. And instantly, you are in negative income. You fight those three battles, during that turn, and before the end of the turn, you just recall your additional lords for no cost, and your supply line goes back to normal, you farmed your tax collector items, and your income goes back to normal. And you pay nothing, because you already paid for those lords for the first time. And you can do this again in about 4-5 to five turns, depending on your cooldown time for your lords. And that's a great way to farm a uh, tax collector if you want to keep a couple of them on the field. Because keeping in young valued heroes on the field is a great way to control your in young fluctuation, as you can always add more or recall them. Obviously, adding more has a cost issue, but if you're adding alchemists, you can at least contribute uh, to increasing your income to alleviate the cost issue or even turn around to a positive. That's what we are showcasing here with the Tax Collector build. Now, back to our settlement. We talked about how to build out the minor ones, what to put in the third slot. For the main one, it becomes pretty straightforward as this is your only tier five uh, settlement location, all your capitals, and you can put some advanced military buildings in them. You can focus on celestial uh, units, the crossbowmen or the guard, uh, they're both very strong, you can get increased rank, but this is usually the least useful for the campaign aspect, as both of these have additional bonuses. For the Celestial Building Chain that ultimately gives you Terracotta Sentinels, they also give you Research Rate and an uh, open slot for uh, Astromancer. While well, Astromancers are pretty useless for the most part in campaigns, the 8% research rate is great in the early to mid game, while you still have technologies to research, as it will greatly speed up your pace of picking up tech and obviously that give you all sorts of bonuses from the tech tree and if you're interested in that we do have a tech tree guide on the channel as well 
although it's going to be outdated soon as they are buffing all the techs in a future patch. Uh, regardless of that, uh, it's a decent building to have in the early to mid game period while you still have technologies to go for on your tech tree. Once you completed your tech tree, however, this becomes far less useful unless you're really building it for the Terracotta Sentinel recruitment. The most useful building is actually the Sky Port. The campaign line of sight is great, the Alchemist we mentioned is great, but the most powerful aspect of this is once it's tier 5, you get one global recruitment capacity increase. And having a ton of global recruitment capacity increase is massive in the late game as your armies stray farther and farther away from your starting territory with all your proper buildings where you can recruit advanced units. So having 10 copies of these buildings combined with having a lot of global recruitment capacity will rapidly speed up how fast you can expand in the late game and it's a very nice building to have. So if you have the slots for them, you could go for all three and if you have even more slots as in you don't have any resource buildings, you don't have any unique landmark buildings, you can go for you know the tier 4 forge building to pick up some nice cannon units, you can go for stable to pick up some cavalry units. I would not go for the jade barrack just because uh, these units can be better placed on any of the minor settlement just because it maxes out tier 3. Uh, but in our case for Wei Jing, we have our three landmark buildings. We have our uh, resource here in the spice. There's just no space. And we kept the Sentinel, uh, Celestial building for the Terracotta Sentinel. But honestly, this guy port would have been better. Uh, we just got a little bit too lazy to change it, mainly because this is a campaign that's on turn 400 with the whole map painted. Uh, anyhow, moving on to our next province, slightly due to the south here, we have the Forest of the Moon. And this one's going to be a little different. We can look at all the icons before we hop into the building browser. We have a resource building and we have a landmark building in a minor settlement. And that's going to be an issue because we're running out of slots to make it harmonize within. We kept a young building with base income for two reasons. One, this maximizes our income, as base income is pretty much the only thing that's going to help you. And the other reason is, if we notice back in the Imperial Road, our Paradise Garden, which is a very powerful landmark building, actually provides one point in. So we're actually not internally harmonized here. So having a county that is one point young will help us out with that. And we kind of fix that here with putting the young industry building down. Then obviously we have a resource building. They all provide 150 for Grand Cathay, except for the gold mine, which we mentioned in Quinlan, which provides 600. And this is the reason why Imperial Road is the most lucrative province you have in the entire game. Even after you paint the whole map, uh, it's just sky high for you. All the bonuses from the different landmark building, granting either local or faction wide income boost, especially the local one. You know, really separate this. The only thing that's kind of holding you back is the fact that Kunlan, this particular uh, county here, has a unpleasant climate for you. It's the only unpleasant climate in your starting area, as you can see here, which will reduce a bit of your income. Even with the reduced percentage, it's still the best. Now, moving on. The landmark building here, we have a Singpo, is a Grand Observatory. And this will make this the best Astromancer recruitment slot because of the additional rank that you get. But aside from that, there's nothing too special about this. And the rest of the settlements will be built pretty much in the way we have described earlier. For the extra slots here, we want to find a protection building and a Jade Barrack. And then for the main settlement, once the two income buildings are set, the others should be military focused, so we have our three advanced military plus two of the regular military building that goes beyond tier three for pretty much the full military build out here. Then continuing on, we move down to the Celestial Riverland. We have one resource and nothing else. So this is the case where it's a pretty bland uh, province. We have our protection, we have our Jade Barrack. We didn't want to repeat the Jade Barrack, so we ended up putting a Skyport here. Uh, which is okay. Uh, it's better to put it in the main settlement as well uh, because we can actually upgrade a tier 5 for that global recruitment slot bonus. In this case, we opted against that 
mainly because this campaign in particular was started on the first patch and during the second patch update they messed up the upkeep where it's doubled for this existing save and that made the Astro, uh, the alchemist uh, not lucrative enough to sp you know spam and locate in the imperial road which is why they're not there so i removed a lot of the skyport buildings because i didn't need that much capacity but in the optimal case you want to keep your skyport over here and then over here you can decide to maybe build either a lower tier unit recruitment or go for another jade barrack just to hit that 10 mark a little bit faster you could also argue for potential to build a, a control building as we never talked about this final infrastructure set it's also mutually exclusive it's more military focused in the sense that it boosts peasant unit whether it's starting rank or recruitment cost plus a little bit of casualty replenishment but ultimately this is a control building it provides additional control uh, but as you can see we don't really have a control problem especially in favorable climates so that's why we opted against it and also it's kind of hard to balance the yin yang situation with those buildings as you don't have another pair to kind of cancel them out which is why we have mostly avoided them then continuing west we have the broken land of tianli pretty straightforward easy to explain two resource buildings put them down advanced military buildings this is the way you kind of want to build them protection building an empty slot and then just your pick of whichever other regular military building you want to upgrade to their max level moving north to the wasteland of Jinshen, we have resource protection we have no special building in the capital so it's the full military suite now some of these buildings are not placed in the earlier spots mainly because i picked them up from ai factions who have them built this way and it's not profitable to try to swap them out at that point but just be mindful if you don't have your harmony buildings in the front and you do get raided and you do get leveled down you are going to have a bigger issue than you know just losing a few buildings you're going to have a harmony issue you'll lose a lot of bonuses which will hurt quite a bit moving north we have the warpstone desert now here we have a strategic location which means we have a landmark building it's the great embassy that provides a bit of base income very useful trade boost diplomacy boost alliance point boost it's a great building it's available level five just put one down for sure you also have a resource building here adds a bit of income now unfortunately you know we have a fur we do have a spice if we had maybe another gold this would be the most lucrative province but we don't so um Imperial Roads is first. This is probably a close second inside Grand Cafe's land. Protection, Jade Barrack, pretty standard. Uh, builds your three advanced military buildings. You ran a spot for the regular ones, and that is perfectly fine because the regular ones don't have additional bonuses like these uh, do, you know, research rate. You have your capacity increase for the recruitment and a couple rank up bonus for the unit that they recruit. Finally moving north, we have the Gunpowder Road. Here we're just going to quickly highlight the landmark building, which is the Ninth Wall. It's a defense building. It's pretty useless based on my opinion of defense buildings. The only thing that's kind of helpful is it has an all army boost of plus six melee defense when defending, which is quite useful. And then there's also a 30% ammo increase for defensive siege battles, which are not all that common. Uh, most of the time AI factions either feel like they can't beat you, so they siege you out a little bit longer or after the latest patch they attack more often for sure but in those cases it does vary whether you have a chance or not with the army you have and 30 percent ammo really isn't going to change too much of that but it's also a level 5 building so you'd be building this last you want to put in as many of the uh, advanced military building as possible in this case we opted away from the celestial dragon unit recruitment site mainly because i have them recruiting somewhere else which we'll talk about once we talk about the great bastion gates but aside from that, put your resource, put in your protection, get a jade barrack down, and you're all good. And we come to our last province, the lands of stone and steel. Same setup, except for we do have, once again, a landmark plus a resource in a minor county. And this provides 
sort of the jade jade blooded sorcerers which are currently not kind of in the game but we have a magic focus essentially getting some wind of magic bonus for all armies casualty replenishment some growth for all provinces the growth is really good you should try to get this as early as you can and this leaves us with the issue of having only one slot for uh, once again our infrastructure i opted once again for the base income maximum you know 300 here uh, that will leave us one point young and actually with this entire build you're going to end up with one point young from all the buildings within grand cafe and that's okay you can balance them with having different heroes on the field or having different lords recruitment on the field that will help you balance out with the characters aside from that we have iron we have marble uh, protection building in the you know county where nothing is happening now this is a bad way to build the county because you kept your Inyam buildings at the end but this is really how we got it from the AI so we kept it uh, but if you are getting the option to build it yourself make sure to put the harmony building in the front and that pretty much wrap up all the standard provinces and then we have the three gates which has a very unique building setup but the way to build it it's quite straightforward the building that you definitely want at all times is the refactory building here it's a water station uh, that goes down to the grand parlor. The beauty of this building is it provides local growth and replenishment early on. And then at tier 5, when you don't need growth anymore because you hit the top tier to get tier 5, you get all province growth. So the three gates can provide up to 30 points of growth faction-wide for all your provinces, and that is magnificent. So this is a very useful building to have and the first thing you should build once you get your gates. The second thing you should get is the sanctum building and overall this is just a recruitment cost discount the attrition is nice but only in the limited land you have outside the gate uh, so it's kind of overrated the recruitment rank and recruitment cost is the beauty of this building and this is why most of my um, gates are recruitment centers and why we didn't end up building an armory building for the celestial units in what was my capital because i was playing mailing for this campaign because we didn't need it we were never going to recruit units there we were all going to recruit at one of the gates that had the armory building built so it's plus four rank from the building itself and then plus five rank from sanctum so it's plus nine rank you'll be max rank the moment you're recruited and you're recruiting at 65 percent discount plus whatever amount of discount you have on the lord recruiting because you could set up a lord in these gates that is a lord magistrate and you pick up all the recruitment discount on that lord and you could have a very very cheap recruitment center now you are paying the supply line cost to keep him there but maybe he's holding a small army to help farm corgan warbands and the extra slots that he have is used for recruiting units and passing them on to other lord who's ready to march out far far away to fight so these are some great early game options that you have you could obviously switch things up not all three of your gates should be this as in this case, for this gate in particular, we went with the stables, and there's another gate where we went with the forge. Makes sense, since these matches the max tier of tier 5. Doesn't make sense to put a jade barrack here, because you could put them in any minor county. So it's basically one gate with the stables, one gate with the forge, one gate with the armory. The other two buildings here are less useful. Defensive setup for siege defense. If you are not planning to expand past the gates, maybe this is good. But in that case, I still don't think these gates need help. And then this one is an upkeep discount in case you're keeping massive armies garrison at the gate, which I also don't think is a good idea because, well, you can make that army very cheap, even free. If you have the right stuff, it's possible. Let's say you have a jade unit army. You have all the jade unit discount items for the heroes and lords you put in there. You have the right skills on the skill tree from your hero or your lord, actually, that reduce upkeep. You could have a free army, but they will still be hitting you with the supply line for all your other armies. So it's still very costly to keep a stack in your gates, uh, especially in all the gates. So this is not a really good building. And I would just offer these two plus one recruitment and just turn these into recruitment sites because the gate itself also provide recruitment for Terracotta Sentinels. So you can get very high level Terracotta Sentinels at any of the gates. In this case, you can see that we have just basically put one of the military buildings at each of the gate and this type of build out can be extended to any potential provinces in the game 
whether they're minor or whether they have a capital component as well, you have the same building access all across the map and you should build them out with the same principle. If you have a port, keep the port. Uh, in this case, we actually have a, a timber resource here, which we didn't build mainly because I picked this up quite late in the game and we never bothered to change it. But in this case, we would end up with just a young building as well. And that kind of follows the logic as you build out the entire map, which we kind of did here. Uh, so even if climate's not favorable, you might want to introduce some control buildings in there. Or maybe if you're on the front lines, you're worried about getting attacked and you know you're going to get attacked and you put a defense building in there. I'm not against that. I just don't think you need to put defense buildings everywhere because it is a waste of money and resource, especially if you can spend that money on additional army or a better quality army that help you push out and create safer borders, then you don't have to waste the money on those land. You know, spend that money early on on how good your first army is or maybe getting a second army so you can expand past, you know, your early starting position so that you are safe and you never have to worry about their safety. Uh, the protection building is mainly for portals, so that is just part of the Realm of Chaos campaign mechanic that we have to live with. Uh, regardless, this is going to do it for our building guide on Grand Cafe. Hopefully you find it useful, and I'll see you all next time. Bye!